Hey, yo, from the Kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the official podcast of the Free State of the Lever, where the E and E motion stands for electrical. I am your host, Brian Thomas. Welcome to the D program. Thanks for stopping through my neck of the woods and hitting the old download button. And trust me, you will be rewarded with a massive, massive upload, a literal fuck ton of consciousness enhancing audio here. Because in this episode, I am chatting with Matt Presti, the former director of operations and president of the University of Science and Philosophy, formerly known as the Walter Russell Foundation, and we're going to be digging deep into the living philosophy of the aforementioned Walter Russell. Matt is also a musician, patriot, philosopher, poet, and practitioner of universal law, and what Walter Russell referred to as a meta-scientist, as opposed to a metaphysician. And I like that distinction a lot. And if you don't know the name of Walter Russell, buckle up because you're about to get a crash course in his cosmogony. And if you already know, well, try to remember the first time you came across his work and his ideas and how they made you feel or what sort of emotion it conjured up inside that blood and bone of yours. And hopefully we can channel some of that feeling again. Now this chat picks up considerable momentum the further it goes. And by the time we flip over to the second hour, we're riding on waves of pure light, running on high voltage and low amperage, hitting the old sweet spot, as they say. In other words, the second hour is jam-packed with esoteric goodness and is, if I may say, quite lit. Patreon, Substack, and Float links in the show notes if you're interested. But enough prologue, let's flip this script to dialogue and let Matt Presti seduce us with his sweet, sweet electrical song. Enjoy. Matt Presti, welcome to what I call the D program. Thanks for being here. Hey, thanks for the invitation. No problem, no problem. It was my pleasure because I've been following your work for many years now. I actually came across Walter Russell's work too many years ago when I was looking at or trying to figure out how light affected my health and then just stumbled into the secret of light, which we'll get into obviously. So before we do that though, I am most curious about how people get to where they are. And where you are, as I see it, is the same place that Walter Russell was. It's a place where I strive to be, and that is within the realm of what we used to call the polymath, which is a word I'd love to bring back into common parlance in the public consciousness. And what I mean by polymath is obviously you personally have a lot of interests and hobbies and disciplines, all of which coagulate in and around what I'll call the general esoterics of the human experience. And I know a lot of what you talk about in these environments is the work of Walter Russell and Leo, his wife as well, and preserving their legacy. And we'll get into that you know, soon, like I said. But to go back to that word or idea of the polymath, I am curious where that story started for you. Was it one subject or one idea in particular that opened up these pathways and portals for you? Or was it something you were exposed to in your youth? Just give us the prologue to the story of Matt Presti. Well, thanks, Ryan. Um... It goes back to my childhood, really. I, I spent a lot of time hiding from the rest of the kids underneath honeysuckle bushes and crawling behind pine bushes and exploring the creeks and territories where, where there were no jungle gyms or, or playgrounds. You know, that, that was my habitat growing up. So I always had an interest in, in my own imagination, especially. I was quite imaginative as a child. And and that, I think, really led me to wanting to be alone in a lot of instances. I, I, of course, did play with the neighborhood kids and often got us all into trouble multiple times doing crazy things. But, you know, that's part and parcel to growing up with an imagination and, and uh, certainly had a lot of fun exploring the world when I was younger. I think it just led to a healthy, that, that healthy imagination really captured the magic of nature because nature tends to work with a healthy imagination. It provides the tools and the resources you need to build the bodies like the forts and the hideouts and the uh, and incredible little stories we, we find ourselves in when using that imagination as a child. Eventually, I would get into music. Thankfully, my parents bought me a little piano when I was a kid, this tiny little one octave Jadwin piano with little chimes inside of it. And I learned to play with one finger, interestingly, much like Doctor did. 
at the age of seven or eight years old, but he was one when he started. So when you hear things like that, the story of genius really is is one that always excels. So polymath is is a term I would say originally meant that somebody who had varying aptitude in an array of university knowledge application. So traditionally, polymath doesn't mean genius, but it's come over the years to, to sort of cross over. So it, it does apply at this time. But traditionally, polymath means somebody who excels at a plethora of university curriculums, university approved, I would say. But again, it's, it is synonymous now. I think it's, its usage is such that mm-hmm. you could use it to connote genius as well. Somebody who's talented at multiple fields of discipline, multiple disciplines and fields and such and studies. And but for myself, you know, it's always a always been a journey just to to learn to do music without having learned how to read it uh, just by ear, as they say, has been a, a tremendous experience in my life. Writing and bringing out those inspirations and those rhythms and melodies, some of which I would wake up in the middle of the night and have an entire song in my head and I the only challenge was to go out into the studio despite it being three in the morning and lay down the tracks for it so there's a lot that that has uh, unfolded pretty much what I learned from Walter Russell and how it's best applied to my life is and it's really a simple saying you can do anything you put your mind to and to me that that's the greatest gift that Walter and Leo departed to the world was that and it's not the first time it's been said, of course, but in this particular teaching, you'll find in the home study course, which is just an incredible thing to experience and go through, that is indeed the way that creation works. And if you put your mind to it, there's nothing you cannot do in this world. Yeah, you mentioned imagination in there, which is part of mind too, right? I think that, that these are, I don't know if these are separate terms. Or the same term, you know, and maybe you could get more into that. But you said something in there that made me think of just the real lack of imagination that we seem to exhibit, you know, socioculturally these days and how I think that that is sort of an underlying problem that we don't realize is a problem is that our imaginations have been muted for the most part. And that it's almost a lost art to be able to even use your imagination or tap into that wavelength of this experience here. I don't know if you have any takes or thoughts on that, but that's kind of, it's a theme that I've been wrestling with in my own life because I do some fiction writing on the side here that I'm trying to get produced or published. And as I've put pen to paper in in that way, it's something that I've, it's just a theme that just like, I guess the muse is just, you know, kind of speaking that to me. Like this is a very important theme to wrestle with, with the ideas that you're working with in this fiction writing environment. And maybe because of your studies of, Walter Russell and his work and what he talks about with mind, you probably have a unique perspective on this, this, what I call the lost art of imagination. Look at the applications today, the, the apps, so-called apps. I mean, the word application means to apply yourself. And so many applications of man are literally these apps on smart devices that only do one thing. They take your imagination out of the world of applying it to the world. You're applying your attention, your attention span to these applications, which are doing all the imagining for you. So we have seen a declination in the rate of imagination, and especially children. I would say it's the most detrimental to that age group under 18, because that, that's the formative years between really two and three, all the way up to the later teen years when, when that imagination faculty needs the most attention. And it hurts me every time I see even my my own grandkids, you know, we try to, grandma and I try to (laughs) try to limit and regulate the time that they spend on their apps. But, you know, like any child, it's, you've got to give them some time, but there's other things that we do to offset and take their imagination out of those devices and put them into the real world. You know, I I constructed a a playground and, and little fort for them to play in and we've got acres of woods here so they run around and when when weather permits you know we get them outside and we do things we walk the trails and make sure you you get a a lot of that healthy time in nature to inspire and inculcate their imaginations so that they can apply that imagination to the, the physical world 
rather than let it be absorbed by an app. So there is that. And then there's, uh, as you said, there is a difference between the brain and the mind in, in the Russell teachings, especially. I think in many mystical teachings, you'll, you'll find this, even though it's not demarcated as succinctly in those other places of mysticism and study of mysticism, but particularly the brain is the, the thinking process of mind. It's what mind basically thinks through the brain, not with the brain. So mind is, is really the omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent field of white light, which is center, centers and bounds all motions, all divisions in the, in the natural light spectrum, the divided light spectrum. And that is really just more or less an excellent model for understanding how imagination is, how idea itself is bulletproof, how before it's divided, it can neither be really created or destroyed, it can only be expressed in a divided body. So much like Dr. Russell would say, often the poem is not the poet, the painting is not the painter. And the symphony is not the composer. Well, what does that really mean? It just means that idea itself is timeless and belongs to the mind, which is the undivided universe. And then the thinking out of that idea belongs to the electric divided light spectrum universe, which divided light in terms of sound is silence and notes. But like Beethoven would say, if there was no silence between the notes, everything would sound horrible to the human ear. There would be no point of silence for the human ear to stop sensing in order to capture the silence between the notes, which is necessary. It's like if every drum beat had no rest between the drum note, then it would just be one solid drum line, which never ended. It would be incomprehensible. So all the universe is moving on a still fulcrum. And the mind is that fulcrum. It is God. It is consciousness. It is truth. It is light. It is beauty. It is silence. It's where rhythm expresses itself from. And all power in motion is at 90 degrees to the motion itself. So the very divided brain, the immovable, motionless center between the hemispheres is where the power for the brain waves come from. And all motions in nature borrow power from the fulcrum to express their motion. And that's one thing man has not really come to understand, being that we're in a hyper-materialist universe where the Iron Age is really the age of materialism, and everything is measured as material and is very mechanistic in the explanations they use for it. And I think that's just part and parcel to man's need to progress beyond the age of materialism and adopt, you know, more of the hermetic philosophies from the, the old ages that still work all these thousands of years later. Yeah. And I think that that is a, that's a great preface to, I think the rest of the chat here. And before we get further into these concepts of light and motion and, you know, thought waves, I guess, I did want to tell people a little bit about just, I guess the last six and a half years of your life up until August 2021, essentially, you were the president of the University of Science and Philosophy, formerly the Walter Russell Foundation. And now you direct, uh, or maybe curate too is a good word here. You run the Russell Museum in Waynesboro, Virginia. And I was just curious if you could summarize, you know, what the purpose of these endeavors are, what these groups, you know, the museum, the university, like, what would you say their mission statement or their purpose is? Well, I was happy to hand off the reins to our incoming president, John Bonzel, who took over for me in August. And uh, I, I currently serve as webmaster for the university. That's the only capacity that I still retain a, a working relationship with them. But the Russell Museum is really, you know, that's the pinnacle of all my hard work. I could not believe I was dumbfounded to hear that in 2010, when I made my first visit to Swannanoa in an effort to learn more about the Russells and people that had worked for them and knew them. And, and in speaking with so many people in that year, when I first visited and hearing that, you know, those, there was 40 plus tons of art and sculpture in a warehouse somewhere, nobody really knew where it was. And there was a big feud, you could say, between the, 
the board of directors and the student body had had a falling out that was now 10 years in. So I was always the optimist. I, I'm like, there's got to be a way to get this stuff back out. It just, you know, the more I studied the philosophy of the Russells, which really is the, again, it's, it's the secret of creation, understanding the wave, if you will, what precedes the wave and what comes after it and how you can create your own waves, which are bodies. All bodies are wave motions. That's one thing they all do is vibrate. As Nikola Tesla said, you want to understand the universe. Think in terms of frequency, vibration. These are the real hermetic secrets that have lasted thousands of years. But the difference between the Russell's course and all the hermetic teachings is this is taught from the perspective of an actual course like you would take in college. But you're learning how to utilize the silence and stillness of your own mind center, which centers your body, you know, centers the dual hemispheres of your own body how to go into that silence and stillness and how to pull out the ideas and create bodies for them. So basically it's a course in how to crystallize your own thought into a body that you can then share with humanity. And that degree of inspiration that you put into that body will uplift the people who experience that creation to the degree of your own inspiration. So really, it's, it's, it's an incredible course on unfolding your genius, I would say. Again, if, if people would like to be introduced more to this subject, visit philosophy.org. And you can, you can read more about the home study course, lots of links on that site. And I think the, the big thing for me was just having been able to do something really that it, it was about an 11-year desire that took 11 years from the point of conception to the point of unfolding for it to become crystallized. So, you know, there's really, when you have a desire, there's no time frame to unfolding it. You just have to continually work toward it until it stands before you, but never give up because that's the key. A lot of people start things and they get these expectations that it should have been done three years ago. And so they just push it off to the side, but Anything you can revisit, you can always come back to something, including things that you're good at when you're a child, like painting, sculpting, writing, drawing, music. You know, there's lots of things that we did as children that we're still good at. We just have to pick them back up and polish them off and dust them off and, and get back into the to the groove, as they say. So really, all all things are possible with the mind, again. And when I completed the museum and, and actually finished it, and it we stood and looked at all the work it had taken. It, it was really a, a divine moment in my life to realize that, you know, the true application of self is just not giving up and, and staying with it. And the, the harder you work and the more you work toward what you're trying to unfold, the more the universe will work with you because the universe works like this. Anything you do, the universe has to meet you halfway. And that's the wonderful story that Leo wrote, the book she wrote called God Will Work With You But Not For You. And that's that's really something profound to consider because for the longest time in my life prior to reading and coming upon the Russell's works, I was always sort of like, God, how come you don't help me out here? You know, you should be giving me all this stuff that I'm praying for. You should be fulfilling my desires. And that book basically said, boy... <laughs> You can pray all you want, but if you don't work, you're not going to get anything because the universe is, will pray with you, but it doesn't mean it's going to act with you. So I had gone through the the secret thing and, the, you know, gone through this and gone through that, but it really never, the, the thing about the new age secret idea, which is the Gnostic version of, you know, creation, which, you know, this is something to escape this world. It sucks. It needs to be transcended. You can't do anything good with it, so you might as well think of the secret and make things happen just with wishful thinking. Well, that blew this all out of the water when I encountered the Russell teachings. It was like coming from a genius who had accomplished the mastery of the five fine arts in his lifetime with only a fourth grade education was all the proof I needed to see that the mind can do anything that it puts itself to doing. And so 
I just really adopted the philosophy and that's how I was able to complete the museum and uh, do all the things I was able to do, including heal the rift between the student body and the board of directors, which, you know, now, now the power is multiplied and there's a lot of really great things happening. I have left the, the Russell legacy in great hands with John Bonzel. And uh, I'm just really happy to see that it's continuing on. And, and now I'm kind of free to go do my own thing. On the museum itself, I think that's a great purpose to have. It's a great legacy to leave too, because it does, you know, kind of going back to the idea of meeting in physical space and like meeting in a natural space, right? Like it's one thing to scroll through a website and read about this stuff and, you know, maybe see pictures of some of the artwork and the sculptures that Walter produced. It's quite another to actually go to that physical environment and pick up the books and and see the photos, you know, see the sculpture, see the artwork like in person in the flesh. It's a different way to absorb the work because all those things, and I assume you would agree with this, you know, especially that artwork that he produced by hand, like those still carry those energetic signatures that he embedded into the work itself, right? Like you can probably feel that as you walk through that museum. And I think that that is why I wanted to just sort of touch on that up front here to make it known that, yeah, there is a physical location. If you're into the work, you know, I guess to this level and you want to get to Virginia, like it's there, like you can go and you can, it's funny, like it's, it's the, it's the living philosophy, like live, right? Live and in the flesh. So I just wanted to to comment on that because I, I think it's a, just like I said, it was a, it's a noble purpose to have, you know, and, and to, to see that come to life, I'm sure you just couldn't be more thrilled with that. And it sounds like you are. Yeah. I, I recommend and, anybody gets but, through Virginia to stop through Waynesboro and uh, again, philosophy.org forward slash museum has all the information maps, all the good stuff there. Um, it's definitely a major inspiration. One of my best compliments that I got were three different museum curators visited the museum. Now I had zero experience in, in museum curation, none. You know, I'm a high school graduate, that's it. Never went to college. So uh, it was surprising enough to my family that I would end up being president of the university. But uh, when it came to museum curation and decorating art on walls, my own home is a testament to, I'm not very good at decorating. <laughs> so, but mm -hmm. something about just the placement and, and where we put everything, we had three different museum curators comment that this was, that the museum was perfect in its layout. And so one thing I did do, which, you know, unlike my own home, I, I did apply the, the balance aspect to everything, that everything had to have balance. You know, and if you just look at the world and your own life as such, you will also produce a masterpiece of your own self. You know, balance. I wrote a song many years ago, 12 years ago or so called Find the Others. But you could you could just as as well say create yourself and find others who have created themselves, you know, because that's really what we're here to do. We're here to create ourselves and, and apply ourselves to the world in a way that has meaning and benefit and produces happiness, you know. So I think that if you're definitely passing through Virginia, it, it would, would behoove you to stop and soak in some of the inspiration of this. 40 plus tons of art and sculpture that adorns the walls of the Russell Museum. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have a friend who just rolled through there that you met actually, and, and she's kind of how we got introduced here. So uh, she had nothing but just positive, kind, and kind of mind blowing things to say about the experience. So you've done something, like I said, noble and something that hopefully will live on far beyond your own lifetime here. So, you know, I guess kudos for that. And so I mentioned too, just a minute ago, that term living philosophy. And this is something, the way that they talk about this, the, the way that the Russells talked about it, the way that you and many others have talked about this, that word living has always intrigued me when it precedes the word philosophy here. And I think that's a key concept to just maybe explain real quick for people who are unfamiliar with it. So when we use that phrase, living philosophy, to describe Russell's cosmogony here, what are we actually referring to? Well, that would be applying yourself moment to moment. And there's different kinds of meditation. The Russell's stressed one in particular that I found fascinating because I'm not a person who likes to sit still. 
You know, I just don't, I, it's, it's hard for me to meditate in a traditional posture, but I would find that when I drive my vehicle for long periods of time, it's very easy to meditate at that point to forget yourself and your body just runs the car, doesn't even have any awareness of itself other than, you know, you're going to turn left here or right there. But for the most part, driving is, is a form of meditation for me that really allowed me to just forget my body and, and use my imagination and, or just sit completely still as I'm moving. So really the, the living philosophy is sort of meditating I would I would say being wholly mind, but using your body to fulfill purposes that would further your goals and desires, as opposed to just living day to day to pay the bills and, you know, when's the next time I have to work. Anything you do, if you're centered and mindful and aware of your own stillness, your actions are going to be more powerful because they're going to be intentional versus unintentional. And I think you could say that one of the major sufferings that we see in the world today are people aren't living intentional, which is also synonymous with purposeful lives. They're le leading purposeless lives. And whenever something feels unintentional or purposeless, it really doesn't have quality. You know, how many people have you worked with on a job who just couldn't care less if they were did doing a good job or not? They cut corners and it actually makes your enjoyment of the job less palatable, you know, and so you're, you're only as good as your team, they say, right? And unfortunately, we, we get these lessons in life where we work with a team who's just not really something you want to be part of because you do the kind of work that is masterful, but the people you're working with could care less. So it makes the job more difficult. And really the living philosophy is always applying yourself, always doing your best, despite the conditions, despite the coworkers, despite, you know, you're not there for them. You're there to do your best and everything you do your best at, you don't go home at the end of the day and, and feel like you could have done better. You're content. You have contentedness because you applied yourself to the maximum degree. And if, you know, it's, as Leo would say, there's no task beneath the thoroughbred. You know, whether it's cleaning a toilet, sweeping a floor, taking out the trash, doing dishes, anything you do, you put in 100% at it, you're going to get 100% out and you're going to feel good about it. So that sort of gives you a more purposeful and intentional application of yourself to the tasks of life, which makes it all the more rewarding. And you're more likely to be happy and happy blood is healthy blood, as they say. So when you're happy, you're healthy. And when you're healthy, you accomplish things and get things done. So that's sort of the living philosophy. Creed is anything you put your mind to doing and doing your best at, you won't go home with a deficit at the end of the day. You'll feel like you've accomplished everything you can to your maximum degree. And you do it day in and day out, every mm -hmm. second, moment to moment, over and over. And that sort of really gives you that blessing that, you know, you, you are doing the best you can and the universe works with you and you work with the universe and that's maximum fulfillment. You know, you don't, there's no deficit at the end of the day. Yeah. So that living philosophy then, which I've also seen and heard described as a meta science. And I really like that word, by the way, I, I know you are fond of it too, but to sort of like boil down the philosophy and the science here. And I, I tried to do this for this conversation because I was trying to focus on specific entry points to his work. And I came up with three concepts and maybe these aren't even the right three concepts. So maybe we, you could help us refine this as we talk through it. But the three concepts I have here are the electrical wave of creation, the secret of light and the law of balance. And we've touched on that already just on a kind of very like surface level like to blow those out a little more. And I know there's some overlap between all of these things. And I don't even know, you know, like I said, if these are the right way to talk about it. But if you don't object, you know, to those concepts, those three concepts, let's let's start with that electrical wave of creation and what that means as the Russells defined it. Sure. Well, the, the wave of creation, understanding it, how it works, both scientifically and from a knowing aspect, when you know something, you don't have to guess at it. You don't have to wonder, is this right or wrong? It's not polarized. It is what it is. It's simply knowing. Like 
I would say like knowing you love your mother or knowing that the sun is in the sky, you know, knowing that it's cold out or knowing that it's warm. You know, there's lots of different kinds of knowing, knowing you're hungry or you're not, or knowing um, that if you do something, something bad's going to happen, you know, or that if you do something in a certain choice pattern, that something good's going to come from that. There's a lot we can know that we don't have to experiment with, you know, touching the hot stove, you already know you're going to get burned. So you don't, you know, you learn that when you're young, right? A lot of things we learn when we're young, we should know better. Thus the saying, you, sh you should have known better, right? When you, when you do something that results in an unbalance. So really the, the key point to the entire philosophy of the Russells is the law of balance. And that is really understanding the dynamic motion of the universe, but how it, it moves upon a still fulcrum and silent fulcrum, which does not move. And that is the mind itself. So in order to even walk, you have to, you have to stand up first, of course, but you have to divide that still point of standing still by stepping forward and you're creating an unbalance, which then has to be met with another step in order to void the unbalance, to keep balance and rhythm in what we call walking. You know, any action the human body takes first begins from stillness and then you create an actual condition of unbalance and then another one and then another one, but that gives us a forward progression so we can move from point A to point B. So understanding the wave of creation is really to understand that the mind is really all there is. As Russell would say, there's two universes. One is the universe of mind knowing, the knowing mind where idea, all idea exists, all power resides. And then at 90 degrees to that knowing, when you turn that light 90 degrees, you get the wave motion universe and you get polarization. You get divided sequences of light of the red and blue color spectrum. You get left and right, up and down, in and out, and uh, all those things that show the seeming duality of the world. And knowing that the balance in the center of the device of motion is always there is really what science has not discovered yet. And that's why the Russells really felt themselves to be meta scientists as opposed to metaphysicians. And they said the difference was great because they understood one thing that, that science doesn't yet understand is that everything moves upon a fulcrum. There is no such thing in nature as a monopole. It, it may be easy to show that there's a, a pole inside something, but there's always a second pole, even if the pole is space itself. So there's always two poles in nature, or there would not be interchange, electrical interchange at all whatsoever. And uh, I think that's important to understand as well when, when you're dealing with the secret of light and how the universe functions as a whole is the electric wave always has a positive and a negative, if you will, in terms of all batteries, right? All batteries, all conditions, every body in existence is doubly charged. Two positive efforts and then those two positive efforts negate and cancel out and the cancellation goes outward where the charge goes inward the canceling of the charge or the expression or dissipation of the wave or the expansion we call it compression and expansion you know like a breath when we breathe in and then exhale heat that's a compression expansion sequence there's always a balance to the wave of creation but in that balance of the wave is the stillness which controls the motions of the wave. So really that the wave itself and is, is an expression of stillness to the degree that desire unfolds to express it. It's, it's sort of a word salad. You know, you're, you're talking a lot of different things here with the Russell language, but it really does when you apply it to nature and look at nature and how things charge and discharge your biggest exhibit for evidence is the human body itself your own body does the very thing that the russells describe in the science the meta science aspect of it all i mean in order for you to recharge you have to lay down parallel with the surface of the earth why is that 
why can't you just stand up 24 hours a day? Because you would discharge to the point where you would collapse if you didn't lay down in parallel with the surface of the earth, which then allows the body to recharge. So you're more or less laying down at 90 degrees in a bed or on the floor in a sleeping bag, whatever you want to use to, to rest, couch, whatever, cot. And in laying at 90 degrees, you're in the light, more or less, recharging so that you can get up at 90 degrees again and then go out and discharge. So it's always charge and discharge. All bodies in, in nature do this. The earth itself does it. You know, it's got a period of darkness and it's got a period of light. But even nature lays down. You see the animals, not counting the nocturnal species, of course, but nature, roses fold up, flowers fold up. They turn 90 degrees, if you will. The folding of the flower is a 90 degree motion. The cattle lay down in the field, you know, things of this nature. You can see it everywhere and they recharge. And then the next day they discharge. So basically that's the two sides of the wave is charge and discharge, but it's always centered by the stillness. And if any balance of this wave interaction is unbalanced in nature, it quickly finds balance. But in man's world, it, it takes longer because he has something that nature doesn't. It's called free will. And in that free will comes the the debits and the credits that will either take away from human civilization or add to it. But it's perfect in its expression because it, it never gives more or withholds any amount more than what it deserves. So human choice itself is bounded by this balancing mechanism. And when people make bad choices, that's when we say bad things happen to them. You know, if you lean too far to the left on a tree branch and you fall off and break your arm, is it God's fault? No, it's your fault, right? Because you lean too far. But the problem is most people think that God is some kind of personal thing that responds to certain wishes and prayers and desires. But I don't want to go too far into this explanation, but it's it's you've got a a three point model here that you laid out to expound upon. But really there's a million different ways you could explain the wave of creation. If it's in motion and it's a body, then it's an effect. But if it's prior to motion, prior to taking a body, it's of the realm of mind. But that right there is the Trinity. The Trinity is the stillness and then the compression and expansion sequences or the charge and discharge that all bodies exhibit. So right there, those three things are the Trinity, which the Russells wrote about as well. And in every single wave of creation is balance. Yeah, that's, I think, the challenge and trying to put together an outline to work through here is that there's so much overlap between the concepts. The language itself is dense when you dig into the actual writing. But I think it's funny at the same time, it's extremely simplistic when you actually sort through all of that. And that's why I was, like, oh, it's really about light, motion, and balance, and electricity, magnetism. Like it's these very, what I would call simplistic concepts that, yeah, they do take some thought power and some intuition, I think, too, to to comprehend. But the concepts themselves are just, they're extremely simple and they're all observable in nature. And that's what I think is most impressive about it is that my conscious mind may not be able to grasp some of this right away, but my observational mind, my subconscious mind is able to actually process this just by walking outside and looking and observing. And so I think that that is what I like about it. It's going back to that stillness, right? If I just walk outside, stand or sit on the earth with a tree, with a flower, it's like I can see this living philosophy literally embodied in everything that's happening around me. So back to the wave of creation just for a moment. You have talked about this in a lot of different ways just over the years too. And one of the, the things I want to point out to the audience here is that you've said before that you know nothing in nature explodes to come into existence. And I, I really like that because it, it shits all over the Big Bang, obviously, which I like to do. But it, it also just, I think it paints this in a different way that like, oh yeah, like the creative process is not something that just happens. It's this two-way motion that goes back and forth, back and forth. And I don't think that that's a very common way to think about it. So if you want to say more about that, yeah, please do. Yeah, well, the universe has always existed and it always will. Again, there's two universes. There's the mind universe of knowing, which is stillness, 
and it's omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent. Think of it as a field of white light, which extends everywhere throughout the entire motion universe, centering and bounding all objects. All objects in motion draw their power from this light, which is 90 degrees, to all bodies in motion. So as I'm moving my arms up and down, the center of me doesn't move. Just like when you open a door, the door swings both ways, but what doesn't move? The door jam, right? The tires spin around on the vehicle, but there's a part of the vehicle that does not move that the tires do move upon. So every motion is occurring on a fulcrum, but yet science doesn't take this into account. They think that the motion is caused by something in motion also. And it's, it's again, it's, you know, you're looking at, this is where these ideas about the Big Bang, which just happened to justify the Catholic faith. You know, that's one of the things science really, the majority of scientific discoveries in the 30s, 20s, 30s, 40s, were not only sanctioned, but approved by the Pope and discovered by Jesuit so-called priest scientists, right? Georges Lemaitre was a Jesuit priest, and he uh, introduced the Big Bang Theory, which Pope Pius XII said just conveniently happened to say that this validates the Catholic faith. I mean, if that doesn't make red flags go up in your mind, not to mention when Dr. Russell published his Universal One, he was notified by a representative of the Catholic Church that if he continued to publish that book, the Pope would issue a decree against it, which meant Dr. Russell would never work in the United States again or anywhere else in the world as an artist or anything else. Because if having a decree issued against you by the Pope was a very serious thing. It meant your income, your livelihood would be eradicated, that you had no standing, you know? So that's really the main reason why he never reprinted the Universal One, which is a very interesting caveat, which he says so himself. Visit the YouTube page for philosophy.org and uh, you can hear a lot of great stuff that we uploaded there to, that goes into that from his lecture series. But really, um, the Big Bang being impossibility, nothing in nature, if bodies came into being, then they would explode all over the place. We'd see this everywhere because the universe is self-similar. What it does on a macro level, it must also do on a micro level. Otherwise, it doesn't have fusion. There are no accidents in nature and there's no coincidences in nature. Nature doesn't make mistakes. I'll just say that much. And when when you have a person like Dr. Russell or like a Goethe or a Schelling, or you have um, Heidegger, or d just the different philosophers and scientists who have observed nature enough to know that there's a great mind behind it, and it does not do things explosively or on accident. That's not to say that the pressures underneath continental plates would cause a volcano to erupt. You know, that that's not quite the same thing. But that's, you know, obviously for a volcano to erupt, there's building pressure over many years decades, maybe hundreds of years, centuries, if not thousands of years. So you look at the Big Bang, they say nothing existed prior to this explosion. So was there no buildup of pressure? You know, it's just the whole of it, really, again, if you look at it from the perspective of who introduced the theory, who validated the theory after it was introduced and said it validated the entire Catholic faith, I think that really tells you that the so-called religious order of the world who who basically is an extension of the Egyptian priesthood because they're just that much unoriginal that they had to borrow pretty much everything from that to um, extend their, their control over the planet. You know, just partial control. There's others who are playing the game as well, of course. But from a scientific perspective, they own the Big Bang Theory. And they've made sure that that is what is taught in pretty much all the universities around the world, it's still a theory. And a theory is something that is unproven. It's not even a hypothesis yet. So this theory is really the, the model being taught. And so when you are taught that things explode, that gives you an entirely foul concept of what the electric wave really does. To understand the electric wave is to understand cycles of growth and periodicity. You know, anything in nature takes many years to unfold. That's why there's one ring on a tree to connote that the tree is one year old. When there's two rings, it's two years old, and so on and so forth. 
And so whatever nature does, it does so purposely over a long period of time. How long does it take for a child to become an adult? How long does it take for the bones to mature in a human body? You know, and, and at what point do we begin to discharge over the charging point of our lives around 40 to 45 years old? Predominantly, all bodies predominantly charge for the first half of their life. And then once you cross that halfway point, the predominance becomes discharging, which is why all planets, all bodies in motion start to throw off rings when they get older. You see, in Russell's science, there's a, this is a seamless cosmology. It very much describes how all bodies in motion are born from parents, which are other bodies in motion. But basically, the sun is a mother-father. The earth is a mother-father. You know, there's a hot red mantle surrounded by a cool blue ocean in the earth. So when you hear this, this saying, Mother Earth, they're, they're only half right. It's Mother Father Earth. Because again, all bodies are doubly charged. There's a male-female aspect to creation. It's divided for a reason. And it takes the interchange of these two dynamics to create offspring, which spring off of the union of opposites. So again, you can you can go into a whole host of different things, but to really understand the wave is to understand that everything comes from one, it's divided into two, those two become one again, to again simulate the oneness from which they sprang by dividing into another two. And that's really the, the process and dynamics of creation. Yeah. Before we get out of the first hour here, I'd like to talk just a little bit more about light as well. You've already mentioned that there are two kinds of light, the divided light, which is the red or blue spectrum, and the other is the white light of mind or the white light of the undivided state of light prior to division. And I know that Walter says that you know light is also the omnipresent magnetic light. I like the way that he describes that there. But is there anything more to say about the Russell view of what light is or, or how we interact with it in the universe or in our own bodies? Because it I feel like I've heard you say before, too, that it's, it's also a subjective experience of oneness. And I was kind of confused by what you meant by that. So maybe you could talk more about that. Yeah, there's a lot one could say about it. The mystical experience often describes the experience of the light itself, which is the undivided light, the light of mind. It's often represented by a light bulb over the head. You know, when you have a, a big idea, you have a bright idea, a flash of light is pretty much the the symptom that many people describe. You could go into multitudes of different people who had this flash of light. It could be, I'm sure you've had it yourself. If you think back, you might have had it multiple different times. It's typically thought of as inspiration. As Dr. Russell would say, inspiration is the language of light that man uses to speak with God. And when you have an idea and it's symbolized by the light bulb over the head, that idea is is basically a flash of light in your mind. And something comes to you when you have this flash of light. You're connecting with that still center in yourself, which is at 90 degrees to your divided hemispheres of the body. And when you tap into that central point, you can bring back these ideas or the concept of that idea that you then have to create a body to house it. So whatever that flash of light is, and it's happened to... 100,000 poets, it's happened to authors, it's happened to painters and philosophers and deep thinkers and even people in, in science who have worked indefatigably trying to, to bring something into existence, like the gentleman who created the laser. I'm sorry, I can't remember his name, but uh, he, he was at the point of losing his funding. It was back in the 50s, early 60s. And so he took a walk down a path in nature, some road back of his field and it was there that he had a flash of light which gave him the knowledge to know i just need to do this in order for this laser to work and then i can get the funding so there's many 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 examples of the light there's a gentleman in japan who holds the most patents in the world he will go underwater and hold his breath until a flash of light enters his mind and then he'll come up so Almost to the point of passing out, he'll have this flash of light and he'll come up and he'll have a new invention in his mind. 
And so he, he holds the most patents of anybody in the world in Japan and in the United States. But just another interesting little uh, caveat of how people access this light. Now, there's safer ways to do it through meditation, through waking meditation, which is really just knowing of your moment to moment connection with the divine light inside you. And really, the divine is a great word to use because that divine light is really within everything. It's within all human bodies. And that divine light is the source of power, which powers the bodies that we use to charge at night and then discharge during the day and then do it over again. So we all have a connection, which is really the, the real definition of oneness is we're all connected to this source of power which is the divinity within each and every one of us. Now, how we choose to use that power is up to each and every one of us. Some people choose that power to slay their fellow man, to put them in embargoes and, and COVID quarantines and force them to do things they would otherwise not do. I mean, there's that use of this power, you know, to create war on your fellow man, to, to do the psychopathic things that, you know, we've seen too many examples of over the past couple of years becoming emergent in society. But then there's those who, who would do other things with the light, like build a family, create a good career, you know, become artistic and, and use that light to be creative, you know, and really that light is available to all. That's really what the oneness behind it connotes is that, you know, you can use it for whatever you want. It's available to each and every one of us. And we all have a choice, which again, evil wouldn't exist if it wasn't for free will. Because if you look at nature, nothing in nature is out of balance. And it doesn't create the toxic effects that mankind and the civilizations do. So that would tell me right there that the Russells were right in saying that uh, nature runs on instinct control, which is really God control. But man has been freed from instinct control and has what is called free will, which is really the, the source of evil. Because if you, if you, didn't have free will, if man did not have free will, then there would be no unbalanced choices. Because we have choice, that's what makes unbalance possible. But with that knowledge comes great responsibility. And I think that's what the, over the many thousands of years, hermeticism and mysticism and the mystical experience of this power behind all choice and behind all motion, and really the consequence of, of knowing that we have that power and the responsibility that comes with it is what has been tried to be taught to awaken man to the process of living a life of balance, as opposed to one that continually results in, in his civilization exploding, if you will, or collapsing. I was going to say, I've, I've heard you say that the law of balance states that to the degree that you break it is to the degree that it breaks you. And that being aware of this balance is key to escaping the suffering of the world, because when you do that, you become a sort of master of duality as opposed to a slave to it. And I thought that was a great way to sort of think about it, or maybe not even think about it, but just sort of like, uh, that's the process, right? That's like when you find that balance, that's what happens is you escape this sort of slave mentality almost, and, and you become then a master of the universe, so to speak, or your universe, I guess, would be a better way to think about that. Uh, Matt, before we go, then tell people where they can keep up with you and your work. You can visit mattpresti.com, M-A-T-T-P-R-E-S-T-I.com. You can link to my YouTube. I, I surf around on Telegram a lot these days. Uh, it's the only social media I use at this particular time. It's not interested in the censorship and all the other garbage aspects of those main bot-like social media platforms. So, yeah, you can just uh, scroll down to the bottom of mattpresti.com, and there's all my social media links. You can also email me, contact me on my contact page there. And otherwise, other than that, I'd just recommend people visit philosophy.org and click on the store and get yourself some Russell books. It's great, great stuff to have on the shelf, especially for future generations. It's timeless wisdom and knowledge that uh, the young desperately need these days. and Keep following the work at the university in its efforts to preserve the Russell legacy. I appreciate you, Ryan, for having me on. No problem, man. And just one more quick thing on the books themselves. Would you recommend to people a certain two or three to start with that make more sense? Well, if you really want to get the, the full cream of the crop, 
uh, intent education that the Russells had planned to, you know, re really the, the crux of the teachings, I would say, are in the home study course. And for 250 bucks, if you're having trouble financially, there is a scholarship program. We just awarded about 10 scholarships over the past few months. So you can fill out a philosophy.org forward slash scholarship, fill out application, send it in, and uh, you'll likely get approved. If you're able to, for $250, get a cosmic education in self-application and genius unfoldment within yourself. Uh, the home study course is the place to be. It's Again, you can spend fifty, sixty thousand at a university and be in debt for thirty years, and you'll never come close to learning what you'll learn for two hundred and fifty bucks, which will last you a lifetime, and also enhance the lifetimes of your children, whoever that course is left to. And it can be read and reread. Uh, the Secret of Light is my favorite book. That's the first one I read, and uh, had the most impact on me. That's for sure. I. I uh, was just absolutely blown away by the knowledge it departed to me. From a musician point of view, it, it absolutely made sense and was a seamless cosmological explanation for how creation truly worked. And there's just all kinds of other great books in there, Atomic Suicide, uh, New Concept of the Universe, if you're more on the scientific end of things. But that, for the most part, the home study course is is one I'd recommend everybody get. It's uh, It's definitely something that will help you unfold if you haven't already. For sure. Well, thanks for sharing that. And thanks again for spending as much time as you did here with us today. Really do appreciate it. You are a, a light in the darkness, so to speak. So thank you so much, Matt. Thank you, Ryan. And there you have it. My thanks again to Matt Presti. MattPresti.com, philosophy.org. Check out the work, check out the course, check out the books, check out what feels like to me to be a more sensible cosmogony and a more sensible way of overstanding and understanding life, the universe, and everything. Or maybe we should revise that statement to the electrical universe, because it seems like Walter Russell could be the godfather of that model. I don't know for sure, so if there are any paid fact-checkers out there, feel free to fact-check me with your opinions on that one. But what's funny about this, or maybe it's not funny, I think I'm just trying not to use the word interesting to describe everything, but I guess what I've learned about the nature of all things is that nature is actually a lot easier to comprehend than the religio-scientific priest class would like you to believe. It's a lot simpler, in other words. I've noticed that personally the more that I've gotten into, for example, health and wellness and how the human body actually works, and what the solutions are to fix what ails us, it's so much simpler than I thought previously. The machinations, the solutions, they're actually a lot simpler than I would have thought had I not ventured into the depths of that space to begin with. Because it's all very intimidating from the outside looking in. It's the same with a topic like law. Universal law, natural law, common law, jurisdictions, policies, procedures, language, linguistics, magic tricks. It's all very intimidating when you're standing outside the circle. Or standing under it. But once you decide to step in and stand over it, dude, it's almost ridiculous how easy it is to see. And I feel and sense the same quality here with the Russell cosmogony, because if the human body works on an electrical level, which is where my health studies have taken me and appears to be objectively true, then it stands to reason that all of nature works in this way as well. Because man is not separate from nature, he is part of it, and thus works in similar fashions. He works with nature, but he can only work with nature if his parts and pieces are compatible. And this is not just electrical waveforms that we're talking about. We're also talking about waves of light and sound, and magnetism, all the things that come together to create matter, to create earth, to create that motion in the ocean, so to speak. My favorite part of Russell's work, actually, and my favorite part of this chat, too, is that law of balance. We got into that a bit in the first hour and expanded on that in the second hour. And the point made was, this law of balance is essentially traditional hermetic principles, right? This is the principle of polarity that you'll find in Hermetic teachings that you'll read about in the Kabbalion. You know, over the last few years, I've heard many people discuss how they think we can transcend duality. And I'm not quite sure you can transcend it, if I'm being literal about it. And to reiterate something Matt said, a complete and total comprehension of this principle actually allows you to master duality and not be a slave to it. And that's what I think we should be striving toward. Now, are mastering and transcending the same thing? I don't think so. Because mastering to me implies integration, and transcending to me implies 
separation from it in order to overcome it. And again, maybe I'm being too literal and these are the same concepts. I don't know. Words are hard, aren't they? And this chat actually inspired me to go back and read that hermetic principle from the Kabbalion just because I wanted to fact check myself there and make sure it really did align fully. And I want to read that here for you because I think it's worth sharing and reinforcing and thinking further about. So this is the fourth hermetic principle, the principle of polarity straight from the Kabbalion. Quote, this principle embodies the truth that everything is dual, everything has two poles, everything has its pair of opposites, all of which were old hermetic axioms. It explains the old paradoxes that have perplexed so many, which have been stated as follows. Thesis and antithesis are identical in nature, but different in degree. Opposites are the same, differing only in degree. The pairs of opposites may be reconciled. Extremes meet. Everything is and isn't at the same time. All truths are but half-truths. Every truth is half-false. There are two sides to everything, etc., etc., etc. It explains that in everything there are two poles, or opposite aspects, and that opposites are really only the two extremes of the same thing, with many varying degrees between them. To illustrate, heat and cold, although opposites, are really the same thing, the differences consisting merely of degrees of the same thing. Look at your thermometer and see if you can discover where heat terminates and cold begins. There is no such thing as absolute heat or absolute cold. The two terms heat and cold simply indicate varying degrees of the same thing, and that same thing which manifests as heat and cold is merely a form, variety, and rate of vibration. So heat and cold are simply the two poles of that which we call heat, and the phenomena attendant thereupon are manifestations of the principle of polarity. The same principle manifests in the case of light and darkness, which are the same thing, the difference consisting of varying degrees between the two poles of the phenomena. Where does darkness leave off and light begin? What is the difference between large and small? Between hard and soft? Between black and white? Between sharp and dull? Between noise and quiet? Between high and low? Between positive and negative? The principle of polarity explains these paradoxes, and no other principle can supersede it. The same principle operates on the mental plane. Let us take a radical and extreme example, that of love and hate, two mental states apparently totally different. And yet there are degrees of hate and degrees of love in a middle point in which we use the terms like or dislike, which shade into each other so gradually that sometimes we are at a loss to know whether we like or dislike or neither, and all are simply degrees of the same thing, as you will see if you will but think a moment. And more than this, and considered of more importance by the Hermeticists, it is possible to change the vibrations of hate to the vibrations of love in one's own mind and in the minds of others. Many of you who read these lines have had personal experiences of the involuntary rapid transition from love to hate, and the reverse, in your own ease and that of others. And you will therefore realize the possibility of this being accomplished by the use of the will, by means of the hermetic formulas. Good and evil are but the poles of the same thing, and the Hermeticist understands the art of transmuting evil into good by means of an application of the principle of polarity. In short, the art of polarization becomes a phase of mental alchemy, known and practiced by the ancient and modern Hermetic masters. An understanding of the principle will enable one to change his own polarity, as well as that of others, if he will devote the time and study necessary to master the art. End quote. So again, some food for metaphysical, or rather, metascientific thought. So, in the second hour with Matt, we expanded further on that principle of polarity and talked about Walter Russell's three-dimensional alchemy. We also got into the idea of the cosmic clock, matter, elements, and the nine-octave cycle. We also talked about spirit and the problem with high vibratory states, the shape of the earth and the optical universe, maybe my favorite part of the second hour there, the Russell's thoughts on income tax, crowd psychology, shadow work, the hero's journey, and self-divinity, spirituality equaling consciousality in the science of man, and we rounded out the chat talking about the cycles of civilization and psychological discontent. So hop on the Patreon, the Substack, or the Float if you want more of that juice. Anyway, in Libra, Ohio news, straight from the Libra Gazette, or whatever the newspaper in town is called, 
a patron-only bonus show. It's coming soon with Sidoral Astrologer Athen Chimenti. So get on one of the paid platforms to get access to that when it pops up in the feed. And I should also mention that I posted the second and third lectures from the Rudolf Steiner series that I started back in December. The first one is available in the free feeds, but the second one and the third one are available only to patrons. This is a four-part lecture series collected in a book called Occult Signs and Symbols, so right up your alley, I know it is. The first lecture is called The Creative Cosmic Tone, Flooding Color, and the Formative Forces of Akasha. The second one is the Symbolic Meaning of Noah's Ark and the Gothic Churches. And the third one is The Symbolism of Numbers. And I have no idea what the fourth one is called, because I don't know what's in these lectures until I sit down to read them for the recording. So I'm hearing them for the first time as I read them to you. Which means you get, essentially, a real-time interpretation of how I'm interpreting the text as I read it. So those little things like which words to inflect on and which words to emphasize, when to slow down and speed up the cadence of the lecture, I'm making those decisions in real time, which I think adds to the reading as well. So if that sounds like a jam you'd jam to, again, links are in the show notes to sign up and support for 7 bucks a month. I should note that if you get on Patreon, I still have options available at $2, $5, and $10 a month which was a way to accommodate patrons who were still paying at those levels for the old culture Patreon. So 7 bucks a month gets you the second hour here, and actually the $5 level will get you bonus content like those Steiner lectures and the upcoming interview with Athen Cimenti. $2 just gets you early access to the free version of the shows, and the 10 bucks gets you everything plus your name in the show notes as an executive producer. So if you're into that sort of thing, donate your little heart out. Anyways, it's a Friday night here in the kingdom, which means I'm feeling right. So, ramblers, let's get rambling. Until next time, you know what to do. Love yourself, think for yourself, and reclaim authority. Please rewind this cassette.